So today we're going to be presenting how we're able to investigate plant traits using affordable and accessible laboratory technology. I'll start with introducing myself. Again, my name is Katsumi Badawi. I've been doing independent research with Dr. Tobin for two years now. My dream is to go to medical school um, and I became interested in plant biology research because my parents and grandparents are gardeners. And I thought this was a fun way to explore my family's interest in plants while also keeping within the realm of science. So hello everyone. My name is Ragad Abulatin. The actual the way to say my name is Ragad. It's a little hard to say, but if you want to learn how to say it, just talk to me after the presentation. Um, I'm a senior in biotechnology major and uh, minoring in chemistry and microbiology. I've been doing research with Dr. Tobin for two semesters now. And um, the way uh, I'm aspiring to be a physician and to have a strong application, um, it's recommended to do research. And that's when I talked to my friend Hatun and she recommended Dr. Tobin's lab uh, to uh, participate in. And when I talked to Dr. Tobin and he interviewed me, um, uh, I, I told him that I work and I go to school at the same time. So I need a flexible schedule and he agreed on that. And that's how I got in. Uh, an interesting uh, thing about me is I love uh, traveling, science traveling, which is what we're doing right now. I like, uh, you know, knowing other culture, trying other food and a different food and talk to the people too. My name is Carlina Schubert. I'm a junior at University of Houston downtown. I am a biology major with a concentration in environmental science. Uh, I'm a returning student after a very long break. Uh, when I, I wasn't very sure about coming back to school at first. Uh, so first I went to community college uh, to part-time while still working full-time. And then when I felt ready, I quit my job and transferred to UHD full-time. And one of my favorite things are puzzles, uh, which is a really handy thing for when you're learning programming because you're always trying to puzzle out what went wrong with the program. It's also one of the reasons I enjoy doing research because uh, it's part of the biggest puzzle that has ever existed. And it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to participate in the community that is working on it. So a little bit about our research mentor, Dr. Tobin. He's also, uh, well, He's a plant physiological ecologist, and not only is he our research mentor, he's also our faculty mentor for Scholars Academy. And I was going to tell you guys a little bit about Scholars Academy in the next slide. So Scholars Academy is a an owner program for STEM students that are in uh, science and technology. It is uh, an application process. There's our requirements to get in, but it gives you opportunities to do research, to meet new people, to uh, network, to communicate with stakeholders, to um, engage with community, just like you. It uh, provides you with a faculty mentor that would that you could talk to throughout your academic journey. And it also have peer mentors that is just students like you that would help you throughout your journey as well and give you um, resources so you could uh, achieve your success as efficient as possible. It is run by the executive director, Dr. Parker, Mary Parker. She is with us in this um, conference. Uh, you might recognize her by the picture. And uh, uh, actually, Carlina has a really nice story uh, about the research and Scholars Academy, which she would share right now. So one of the programs that Scholars Academy uh, connected, connected me to was DOED and SCIP. And this enables students to, uh, students who might not have gotten into research for financial reasons to be able to, uh, to be able to afford to do it. So they don't have to work as many hours and they can instead get the experience of research. Uh, if it weren't for Scholars Academy, I, don't, I wouldn't have had that funding and I might not have gotten into it nearly as early as I did. Um, 
as soon as I transferred in, they encouraged me to apply. And if I, I didn't know anyone at the time, and if it weren't for that encouragement, I would have waited longer and missed, maybe missed some opportunities. So I'm gonna tell you all a little bit about the research that we wanted to conduct before I get into the technology side of things. Um, our overall goal was to determine the trend in functional traits amongst individuals of the grass species little blue stem across the precipitation gradient of Texas. Yeah. So let me break that down for you all a little. I realize that might sound intimidating, but it's really not as complicated as it sounds. So first, let me explain what functional traits are. Uh, functional traits are clearly defined characteristics that strongly influence the organism's growth, reproduction, or survival. And what's interesting about these is that they're applicable to any organism. So it's not exclusive to plants only. And an example that we all might be familiar with are uh, Darwin's finches. So if you ever took uh, a biology class, you might know that Darwin noticed that these finches had different food sizes. and these beak sizes correlated with how well they were able to feed, therefore contributing to their survival. So that's functional trait, different beak sizes. And functional traits can vary. So some species might have an optimal functional trait that allows them to survive the best they can in their current environment. And the functional trait in plants that we chose to focus on were stomata. And stomata are pores in the leaf's upper surface usually uh, and lower surface as well. They're responsible for the gas exchange that a plant does for the process called photosynthesis. And this gas exchange is vital for the plant to make food for itself. And while the plant's stomata are open, it releases oxygen into the atmosphere while taking in CO2. And while these stomata are open, the plant is unfortunately losing water vapor through these stomata. And these stomata play a big role in a plant's ability to survive drought conditions, which is why we looked at the Texas precipitation gradient. So the map is pretty self explanatory. We can see that there is a dramatic east to west precipitation gradient. And we sampled along the transect uh, of uh, we sampled grasses along the transect that I have uh, on the map up here. So to sum it all up, we were trying to determine the trend of stomatal characteristics between individuals of little blue stem across the Texas precipitation gradient. So it all starts with sample collection, which is a pretty easy process. We used everyday supplies to accomplish this. And I have some pictures of the supplies that we might use. <laughs> and these are native grasses, so we're able to sample locally. We don't have to leave Texas to be able to sample native uh, plants. And what's great about plants is that they're also immobile. We don't have to go running around in a field trying to capture these plants. So very easy to sample from. And like I said, we use everyday items and we would use these items to store the samples until they are ready for processing. So they would stay hydrated. And the next step would be sample processing. And we made impressions using clear nail polish. These impressions were lifted off the sample and taped onto slides. And then we would observe these slides using light microscopes. So far, everything that I've mentioned are either house supplies or equipment that every lab has. Very accessible equipment. And what's great is that as we practice with this equipment, we're learning transferable skills that we can apply to our courses in, um, in the college, right? And this contributes to our course success as well. So using these little slides, we were able to gather an abundance of data. Using the light microscope, we were able to determine the stomatal density, which is how many stomata there are per uh, unit area of the leaf. And we also use these slides to capture images of the stomata, like that image right there. And for this, we use something a little fancier. It's a research grade microscope that's capable of taking magnified images of the slide. 
And what's really great about using equipment like this is that it's it's the real deal. It's super fun to use. And it really feels like you're contributing to uh, something out there. So uh, after these images were taken, we would then uh, store any data that we gathered in a cloud, which was accessible by everybody in the lab. And because it was accessible by everyone in the lab, it played a big role in our organization in the lab. So like this, we're able to seamlessly transfer data from one another and each uh, play our respective roles. And that's where the Vahat comes in with the image analysis. So uh, since the uh, data was uh, saved in the cloud, we were able to do image analysis, which is a really cool and interesting thing that you could do. Um, for this, we used uh, image, J, image J, which is a, the National Institute of uh, Health Laboratory for Optical and Computational in Instruments created Image J, which is a forerunner for Fiji, um, to be able to get the length and the width of the pictures or the images that we got from the um, from our other team. So um, it's an image analysis software. It's Java based. That's fancy, but it's free. So literally, and it's easy to to install. So literally, you have just to Google it and download. How amazing for me, that looks. <laughs> and uh, another thing, good thing to mention is that it's an open uh, resource. So you didn't have to, to worry about anyone picking on you, government wise, or like, you know, you're not going to get sued, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and um, I would like to show you how the process went. So this is the original scan of a grass that we got. And then we were able, through that program, the, the image J, to limit where we want the um, area to be measured. So we were able to select that we want this grass. And then after doing the settings, we got the, the numbers that we needed, right? <clears throat> and again, we used that to put it in Excel uh, for other teams to see it as well. And another thing that we were able to do too was to measure the stomata length that we can see over here, which is pretty amazing because you could imagine how small it is and how we were able to, to do this. So we basically converted the, the images that we got to an actual number that we could work in and instead of statistical uh, way. And again, we uh, used the cloud storage to put or to input or our data in for other teams to access to be uh, to have access to it. And another cool thing, it's a fancier thing too, but it's in our lab, which is the sensor balance. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, we were able to weigh the grass and uh, take that weight and put it in Excel, the Excel sheet that we all can access uh, to, and uh, hand it over to our statistical team so that they could work with numbers. So once we had the, the living organisms translated into a numerical form, then we could analyze it with statistical analysis. Now, our lab prefers to use R programming. Um, it's a pretty popular language for using for statistical analysis. Uh, you'll read a lot of, there's lots of papers where they will cite their use of R and will list which package that they used to do their analysis. So if you want to repeat their findings, you can, download that package and do exactly what they did. Um, it's, also an, it's also a free software like the MHJ is, so you don't have to pay for it as long as you, you know, list in your methods that you use their programming. Uh, there's a large active community of users, and that's great for trying to see if someone else has already solved your problem or someone has already done a calculation similar to that one, and then you can adapt their script to fit your app. Uh, the other program that we use is Excel. Uh, we use this for data entry just to, because it's very easy. Most students have had some, some sort of experience with Excel and the university uh, provides a Microsoft 365 account. 
so that everyone has access to it. And it's a pretty popular thing to do. We use it for very simple calculations and the final graphs. Now, this is an example of a type of graph that might be asked for by a certain professor. Um, it is, it, he gives us very specific requirements for these graphs, not just because, you know, it makes the graph very clear and very readable, uh, but also because it's a, it's something that a student is going to have to do someday, either for another professor or at their job. Your boss can have very specific requirements for how they want their images to look, and you need to be able to follow the directions. This is a good practice for doing that. So why learn a programming language? So, I mean, it's already a transferable skill in and of itself. You can put, you know, I know this this or that programming language on your resume and it, it opens up jobs just by itself. Um, the statistical skills are in demand right now. Pretty much any research lab is going to have to demonstrate that they did some kind of statistical testing or something to show that their research was worth doing. It's also great for uh, teaching critical thinking skills because you, every time that you write a script or even just adapting a script to your uses, you have to break your problem down into little bitty pieces and you have to think on your feet and you have to adapt to the changing circumstances. And that all goes towards, you know, making, making the students smart. Also, there's sort of a shift in perspective that you get when you learn a programming language. It just makes you look at your problems a little differently. It even makes you look at your computer a little differently uh, once you actually get sort of the hang of how a programming language works. And once you learn a programming language, uh, it's very easy to pick up more languages after that. Because um, you sort of get a, a, a handle on how they work and then it's easier to keep going. All right. so. Some data was just beyond our means to collect, and that would be more about the precipitation that I was showing you earlier with the map of Texas and the gradient. So this is when we would have to rely on external resources. And when we want to take data from external resources, we need to make sure that we're using credible sources because this is real data that we're working with and we don't want to inaccurately portray anything. So. The precipitation data we actually got from a prison group. It's a Oregon State University. They were able to collect the data and we used these data points to generate that precipitation map. And another great place to look for reliable resources is the university library. So the great thing about university libraries is that they pretty much do all the credible checking for you. So all you have to do is really just find what you want. This way, you don't have to worry about whether the data that you're using is right or not. Um, and another great thing about university libraries is that they often get you access to research papers or other sources that might otherwise be blocked by a paywall. And some students just don't have the means to be paying for a paper every single time they need to read one. So through the university, we're able to access these papers and therefore we're able to expand our knowledge base and it really supplements our education as well as the quality of research that we're conducting. So for our results, we were able through these affordable and accessible and easy to use um, or easy to install uh, tools and technologies that we had, uh, we were able to construct a poster, which will, or it already did, we, it opened doors for us to um, participate in other conferences. We have an upcoming one uh, on April, uh, which is really, uh, it's really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and um, through conferences and through the studies that we do, it's an opportunity for us to uh, network and to communicate with stakeholders, with other professors, with other students too, and share our experience um, together. As a minority institution, uh, we, I don't want to say we have limited uh, resources, but we work what we, with what we have. And that's why we're focusing on 
you know, affordability on and uh, flexibility of and, and helping students to to at least uh, get experience and uh, put good stuff on their resume so they could get good careers and maybe go to uh, graduate school or professional schools. Also, it's again, it's it gives us a transferable skills, not just by the tools that we use, but also by the data analysis and interpretation that we uh, got to do. Because as Hatu said, it's something that will go with us for the long run with our careers, with our studies, with other even courses. And also it's a great thing to uh, have also adaptability and uh, flexibility to be able to learn new skills and uh, to be able to use new technologies with an open mind. And also another thing is the critical thinking because it expands your thinking and expands the way that you could uh, solve problems and collaborate with other people and be able to meet deadlines, be able to communicate efficiently be able to tell each other what we got and we even like had to explain to each other what is this why we got this how it connects to each other you know and it's a great thing because it um it helps you to be involved it's uh it helps you to be you know uh i don't know how to explain it but it feels that you're included and that you you have people to support you throughout your journey too <laughs> All right, so what I really like about UHG is that you can actually get credit hours for the research that you do. They offer a course that allows you to get three credit hours, so like a regular class, and you're able to conduct research with a professor of your choosing, and of course they have to accept you into their lab as well. So not only is this really good for you as uh, a GPA booster, if you do well in the lab, it's also something that you can use to, like I mentioned earlier, apply to your other courses and ensure your course success. And something that we've been pushing for the whole presentation is this narrative of transferable skills. Because after you graduate and you're let out into the real world, you need to be able to actually do these things that you're planning on your resume, right? Um, and as Carlina mentioned, some <clears throat> programs also offer a stipend for the research that you're conducting, which really gives uh, students a lot of financial breathing room. This way, they're able to pursue their passions and uh, conduct the research that they are interested in, while also not having to stress as much about working uh, a job while being in school. So volunteer hours are something that you can also gain from a research lab, especially if you've been conducting research like me consistently for uh, the past two years. Um, since I do want to go to medical school, it's important that I show them that I have the determination and the dedication to conducting something as long term as research, as well as the ability to produce a product like this presentation. And as we stated, UHD is a minority serving institution. And when you're uh, with other students who are also minorities, it's very, very encouraging actually, because it feels like we're all rooting for each other. We all want to see each other succeed and we have each other's backs. So it's a very uh, collaborative and supportive community. And finally, organization is a really important skill that you also pick up while you're in a research lab. So some students might enter the research lab thinking that they've got okay-ish organization skills, but they will really leave having top-notch organization skills and communication skills as well. So one of the ways to increase the accessibility of research is to basically give your students choices. So in our lab, we have, you can either do solo projects just by yourself, if that's, if that's what you have the time to do. You can do team projects like I've been doing with my dad and team. You can, uh, it's important to have some flexibility for how people do research and, how, and what time. Uh, this, this way they can fit it into their very busy schedules. 
and it gives them more opportunities to be able to show up to the research. The transferable skills, what I'd like to touch on for those is you really need to demonstrate that your lab gives transferable skills. Um, that way, the student understands what they're gaining from participating <clears throat> in the lab. Um, sometimes students just don't, it doesn't get to that. Um, and the, as long as you can impress them upon it, then like, that's what they're there for at school for is to get these skills. One thing I'd like to mention about my personal experience here at UHD. Um, so UHD focuses a lot on group work. Uh, each of, most of the classes have some sort of groups that you form and that persist throughout the semester. And the relationships that you build in these groups, um, they, they give you this social and sort of academic support system. Uh, that's It's beneficial for everyone, but it's crucial for when you're new and when you're struggling with something. And those relationships really just make you like, they'll get you through the tough times. Um, and when the last time I was in school, I was at a big state school. We had these gigantic classes and you, you might never sit next to the same person twice. The, the closest you might get to one-on-one -on -one, um, mentoring with the professor is like, you know, having a deep conversation with one of their grad students or something. It's just a very different experience. Um, and feeling like you're alone in a sea of people is just not a recipe for success. And this is really nice because we we had to actually talk to Dr. Tobin face to face and like meet them once meet him once one and we didn't have to go through all the appointment thing with like the grad student or the TA or the a PhD faculty member, you know. So it was a great thing to to give the knowledge from the actual source. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it for other for our presentation. If you have any questions, we'll be so happy to answer. Any questions? We have a question. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm um, sorry. Okay. If you could please say your name and from which institution you're sure. coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alda Cordero, and I teach computer science here in Puerto Rico at the University of Sagrado Corazon, um, Sacred Heart University. Um, what uh, are you graduate students under the Undergrad. Undergrad. What, what year? Um, senior. I'm a senior. Senior. Junior. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. And that's a good point, actually, to touch on that we did all this while being in undergrad. undergrad students, right? Because I know a lot of people, like I have friends who are in graduate school and now they're starting to know how to use the balance or like the microscope. Or, and I'm just like, wow, I did this. You know? <laughs> What motivated you to go into research? So uh, I'm going to medical school. I'm applying to uh, medical school hopefully soon. And um, it's recommended for a strong application to have a, a, a research experience. Research and experience. Yes, so. yes. So for me, it was a really good thing because I was in, I, I am in the DOED as well, which we mentioned earlier, you weren't maybe here yet. But this is a, a stipend program from Scholars Academy for people who wants to do research for a semester. They give you, they give them a, a stipend for it. And I work, I go to school. It's a lot. <laughs> so having, you know, this is the thing would would mean a lot, even if it was just a little bit, you know, or just a push. But at the same time, so you get the financial assistance and you get the whole experience. And the good thing about it that Dr. Tobin was really flexible with me and with my busy schedule because I I worked online and then I had to come like a few days a week for the actual you know lab work as well. I think another really good thing about research is that it can help clarify your career goals. Some people go into school thinking they want to do one thing and then they actually get the experience and they're like, well, maybe this isn't exactly what I want. So by having these research experiences, of course, you can try working with different professors who work in different fields. Uh, it helps you see the big picture so that you get a better idea of what you want for your future. That's good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, we have a question. Um, this is Dr. Toledo. 
first of all, she wants to congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. And she said, uh, wonderful research. Thank you. And then she has a question. Uh, she asks if there are many nonprofits that can help small brand or financial to back up. So just a quick thing, maybe I, I forgot to mention. So Scholars Academy gives us scholarships opportunities as well. So it's, a, it's an honor program uh, and we get uh, around $3,000 every year. And additionally, they also um, give you or like give you information about other scholarships that you could apply for that would help you as well throughout your uh, yeah. academic journey. The Scholars Academy is just at our school. Like, yes. It's, it's, it's a program that they formed as a sort of honor program. Mm -hmm. And what they'll do is they'll send you an email each week that's like, okay, here's a list of seminars you, you can go to. to. Here's a field trip opportunity. And here are some scholarships you can apply to. And here's when they're due. And this is what majors might be interested in them. And that helps a lot when you're, you know, looking for some extra money or looking for something, you know, interesting to do over the summer. And they were kind enough actually to sponsor us now. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's really cool. Any other questions? That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> No more questions here? Okay. Thank um, you. Well, thank you for your question and participating in this session. Um, in person participants, please use the QR code on your name badge to access the link to evaluate the session before leaving. Please select the correct track and time. Soon participants, uh, please access the evaluation link on the chat so you can complete the evaluation as well. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.